Well, a very warm welcome to you, and welcome back to another week on my allotment. Um, I haven't got long up here today. Uh, Charlotte and Carl, our daughter and son-in-law, are visiting just before midday, so I've come up early to get some watering done, um, and probably just a few specific small jobs, um, and then we'll have to see, really busy at work this coming week. So I won't get a lot of time up here, and I haven't got time today to sit around and enjoy it. Um, so um, I've got to crack on. But you're welcome along. Uh, I am going to do the last, or maybe the penultimate story um, from the the body book, and it's an absolutely fascinating and quite hilarious story about the oldest lady that ever lived. So hang around for that. Um, so yeah, without further ado, um, let's have a look at these few jobs that I've got to do. Right, the first thing is, I'm with the tomatoes. And um, I'm really pleased with the way they're going. I thought they would ripen quicker than they have with all this glorious weather. Um, however, on a trickle basis, we're starting to crop. Um, and now we're into August, the plants don't need their leaves. It's all about filling out and ripening the fruit. And the leaves actually get in the way. They stop the sun and the light reaching the fruit. So uh, chop all your tomato plant leaves off and let the sun get in and ripen what you've got and to that end I've got on some of these plants the little yellow flowers that are trying to form fruit they're never going to make fruit this late in the season so to, again to prevent the plant wasting energy on leaves new growth and fruit that will never ripen chop them off and stick with the fruit you've got and let the plant concentrate on those so, yeah, taking off the leaves of the tomato plants. Well, I know it sounds daft, I can't believe I'm hearing myself say it, but don't forget to harvest. When I walk around these plots on the site, it's amazing how many crops are going to waste and not being used. So you've spent all summer, spring, preparing, sowing, tending, watering. Don't forget to harvest. And of course with beans, these are French beans, but the same with runner beans, the more you pick, and pick them early so they're tender and sweet, but the more you pick, the more grow. So harvest. I should just say, I had a lovely uh, sit down with my cup of coffee by the pond and I, this morning as the sun came up and it started to get light watching bats over the site um, if you've watched me for a while you know I had a bat up in the umbrella of my picnic table so I know there are bats around here but I've never seen so many over this site it was a lovely site I was hoping one would come in and drink from the pond but not so lucky well earlier in the year I saw a tray of um, edamame bean plug plants and we eat them in our salads so I thought let's give them a go I've never grown them before I know nothing about it other than the edamame bean is a, an, a junior or an infant um, soybean so I've got my plants here and I had a look online last night and it says pick them when the pods are green um, and that they're swollen with the beans inside. So, I 
I've only got a tiny little crop, it's not going to come to much, it's really an experiment. But I haven't looked at these before. So, yeah, the young uh, soybean, that looks good. I'm going to crop a few of these this morning and take them home and we'll cook them, let them cool and we'll have them on a salad this week. Well, those of you who followed me for a while um, and didn't unsubscribe after the last video <laughs> um, will know that I'm growing the um, gourd birdhouse. And it's, it's a really uh, fun adventure. Um, I found them online, I don't remember how. Uh, they're a big thing in America. I wasn't sure we'd have the right climate for it. Um, little did I know we'd have a one of the most unique summers uh, in living history, uh, which has done these the power of good. And what I wanted, just like with the um, Trombocini squash last year, I wanted them hanging down from the frame. And it's, it's simply about fun. I'm enjoying it. And, and here we are. They're now coming through the trellis on the top and I've got fruit hanging down. I just hope, fingers crossed, that this frame I built <laughs> out of bamboo canes and an old trellis is sufficiently strong enough to hold the weight that is about to develop. Um, I'm watering them like mad. Um, I'm cutting off all the excess growth that's trying to lead out um, and trail. Uh, and it is prolific, so you've really got to keep on top of the, um, the trailing plant. Um, but yeah, I'm chopping it all off, restraining it on here, because I really do have a phenomenal amount of fruit on it now. Really interesting to note that this side faces the sun all day long. This side is obviously in the shade of this side and there's very few plants on here. They really do need the summer sun. So I'll just show you um, how many fruit I've got developing. Well, wherever you look, <laughs> it's fantastic. Wherever you look, there are wonderful fruits developing um, but so far the king of the beasts is this one yeah you know, that's my hand and that wow that is heavy already and that's probably only half size so absolutely loving it and the last couple of plants on the end are cucumbers and We've got more cucumbers than we know what to do with. So this frame, as it did last year, is providing a great amusement, interest and a little bit of work. I'm loving it. bits to read to you. Um, the ladies in the audience might find it mildly interesting. And the first one is about um, menopause. It's been in the news a lot recently. A um, lot more action being taken, thankfully. Um, and it, the one thing that's come out of this book for me, the sort of lasting overarching message, is how little we understand about the human body. And the menopause is, uh, falls into that category. Women are vividly reminded of the ageing process. That's not a good start, is it? When they reach menopause. Most animals die soon after they cease to be repro reproductive. But not, and thank goodness of course, human females. Who spend roughly a third of their lives in a post-menopausal state. We are the only primates that undergo menopause and one of the own, only very few animals that do so. The Florey Institute for Neuroscience and Mental Health in Melbourne studies menopause using sheep for the simple reason that sheep are almost the only land-based creatures known to experience menopause too. Well, I didn't know that. At least two species of whale also go through it. 
How the hell did we find that out? At least two sp oh, just read that. Why any animals get it is a question yet to be answered. The bad news is that menopause can be a terrible ordeal. Hot flushes are experienced by about three quarters of women during the menopause. It is a feeling of sudden warmth, generally in the chest or above, induced by hormonal changes for no unknown reason. Menopause is related to a fall in production of estrogen, but even now there isn't any test that can definitively confirm the condition. The best indicators for a woman that she is entering menopause, a stage known as the perimenopause, are that her periods become irregular and she is likely to find herself experiencing a sense that things aren't quite right. Menopause is as much a mystery as ageing itself. Two principal theories have been advanced, known rather neatly as the mother hypothesis and the grandmother hypothesis, and I've never heard this either. The mother hypothesis is that childbearing is dangerous and exhausting, and it becomes more of both as women age. So menopause may simply be a kind of protection strategy. By no longer having the wear and distraction of further childbirth, a woman can better focus on maintaining her own health while completing the rearing of her children just as they are entering their most productive years. This leads naturally to the grandmother hypothesis, which is that women stop breeding in middle age so that they can help their offspring raise their children. It is a myth, incidentally, that menopause is triggered by women, women exhausting their supply of eggs. They still have eggs, not many to be sure, but more than enough to remain fertile. So it isn't the literal running out of eggs that triggers the process, as many doctors appear to believe even now. No one knows exactly what is the trigger. Yes, the human body is so complex that even modern science today doesn't understand a lot of it. I would just say, um, you know, my wife works in a doctor's surgery as a receptionist, so she works with 23 other women on different shifts and so on. And they're all of that age, and um, Cheryl has been through it with not a single symptom, not a single one. And yet these other women suffer terribly, at all to differing degrees. And we don't, excuse me, runny nose, we don't know, but um, we went uh, whole food plant-based, so we cut out all animal products about six or seven years ago, um, just as you know, Cheryl was approaching this stage and she hasn't had any symptoms. And my friend Brian, who watches this channel and who has been going down that road of plant-based, cutting out meat and dairy and had some fantastic health benefits, his wife decided after she saw the benefits that he was reaping to follow the same. And he commented to me that her menopausal symptoms had um, alleviated since she started doing that. So rather than treating individual ailments, by going plant-based you treat the whole body to good health and the body solves its various problems. Anyway, for, especially for the women in the audience, I hope that was mildly interesting. It didn't really tell you much because we don't know much. <laughs> well I haven't brought you here because there's a job to do other than watering at some point this morning. But I just wanted to show you that um, the pumpkin patch is doing well. I've counted 11 and because I've got two plots and the farm shop requires six from each, I need 12. But I'm sure I've just not spotted another one. Um, but they're doing fantastic. And they're colouring up nicely. I mean that's the perfect size I think. Just slightly smaller than a football. And there's plenty of them there. Just one comment on this uh, purple kale. My theory um, is correct, I think. All the green brassicas have to be netted. They don't last a day without the nets on. The cabbage white annihilate them. Um, and interestingly, back at my greenhouse, 
because I have to open the door otherwise everything fries every day I'm trying to grow some uh, savoy cabbage plants and I'm failing miserably because every time I go in the greenhouse and I mean every time there are cabbage white caterpillars on them and the, all they are is a, a group of small sticks however this purple kale um, although it's odd that some are developing and some aren't is completely untouched by the cabbage white they're not interested in the slightest and you can leave them unnetted uh, with no problem one solitary ripe tomato on that plant it is strange how things grow when we brought the old shed from my back garden up here as a tool shed, growing against it were two um, blackberry bushes and I had to chop them to the ground to get at the shed. So I brought them up here and they're either side of this frame and I planted them, I mean it's got to be back in early spring now, and they didn't move and I've watered them and I've cosseted them, fed them, um, but very slowly they have climbed this arch and they're going to be a permanent feature on here so I'm assuming that the canes I'm growing here will fruit next year um, and I'm pleased to say that the one on the left has gone up and over <laughs> and has made it that far I think that will probably stop its growth simply because you know nothing likes to grow downhill but um, on this beautiful Sunday morning, I'm very pleased that finally um, the plants have gone away. Fantastic. Another small observation. When I put this shed in, uh, there used to be a pagoda thing. Is that the right word? Um, anyway, there was a shelter there with a bench in and I had to dig it up. And, I, and again, there was another uh, blackberry, Reuben, on the end here. I dug it up and I replanted it elsewhere. What I didn't realise is I'd left a piece in and every year it comes up between the cold frames and the shed and this year it's really done quite well. Now bearing in mind we haven't had rain since March and it's growing out of a gap between the shed and the cold frames. It hasn't been watered at all and it's got fruit on it now I can pick and it's growing up and away. Now, in contrast, there's my kiwi fruit plant that I'm watering and, and looking after and tending and feeding and it has not moved since spring. It's deciduous so it loses its leaves and in spring it developed leaves. It got a bit of a clobber from a late frost but it's survived. But it just has not moved and in fact the leaves look like they're deficient in nutrients and yet I'm feeding it you know it just goes to show sometimes if you leave nature alone it does so much better than when you try and interfere <laughs> yeah and the traffic is building on the road and um, the sun is coming up over the site another job I'm going to do is I'm going to take the net off the blueberries and the net off the strawberry plants today because they're well and truly finished I'll just point out the fig. I have pointed it out before. Melvin gave me. It's a cutting he did last year. And very generously he's given me one of his. And I potted it on into a slightly bigger pot. I've put it on top of an upturned tub because something was digging the compost soil out. And I don't want it t touching the roots because it'll kill it. So I've put it up like that and that's stopped the problem. But it really is doing well. Again, another plant that's loving this weather. Well, as is um, usual at this time of the year, as we move into late summer, I've got two very empty beds. Um, now, uh, I'm going to try and uh, grow some more French beans. We won't need them, but I thought I could grow them, harvest them and take them to the farm shop and get a little bit more income for them. So I've got these two empty beds. They were onions and I've harvested those onions and then cleared the beds. 
And here's another job to do. I'm going to start it today. This is a bed. You won't believe it, but it's an onion bed. They're in there somewhere. The nasturtions have gone mad. Um, I've taken out the calendulas from there. And they're all, you know, because I couldn't weed around the nasturtions, the weeds have developed. But they're all, all those onions are coming out, if not today, at the earliest opportunity. And I'll show you the onions I've taken out so far. Well, I've mentioned before, the pond used to be here. And the only surviving uh, plant from the pond area, I kept this dahlia. And it's absolutely beautiful. It's an absolutely gorgeous thing to have right next to the seating area. There's no scent, but just the flowers themselves are big and blousy and lovely. And next to it is the um, raspberry canes that were coming out of my main raspberry patch. And I've moved them, dug them up. I was a bit worried I couldn't get a lot of root out because the ground's so hard. But I've watered and I've watered and these plants have survived. Thrilled to bits with that. So next year maybe we'll get a crop. And again, I've mentioned these blackberries before. Um, they're all a bit small, even though I was watering them. But oddly, um, they've put on a spurt recently and really swelled up. And they, uh, Not only do they taste fantastic, and we're having them on our breakfast every morning, but they look beautiful. They're an attractive plant with the red and the black. I love them. And next year's fruiting canes have all got to be tied in soon, ready for the winter winds. Well, here's the um, onions that I dug out of the, the bed, the one bed, um, earlier this week. I've put them round here. They're not in the sun yet, but for the vast majority of the day they will be. Um, some absolutely whopping onions. I mean, you could argue they're too big. You know, Cheryl often says to me, can you get me a small onion? But um, <laughs> I'm afraid the answer this winter will be uh, no. <laughs> She'll have to take them that size. But yeah, lovely. Absolutely wonderful. And next to them, the parsnips. Haven't taken any out yet. I have no idea how they're doing. But I do water them quite regularly because they're in tubs and they will bake in this heat. But again, they've not wilted. They look good. So I'm hopeful. There's one little bit about um, ageing in this book that I found fascinating and not a little funny. Um, sometimes life just works out. So if you'll bear with me, you will find this interesting. The longest lived person that we know of was Jean-Louise Calment of Arles in Provence, who died at the decidedly ripe age of 122. There are other people who have claimed to live longer, but she had a confirmed birth certificate and documents to back this up. 122. Oh, sorry, 122 years, 164 days in 1997. She was not only the first person to reach 122, but also 116, 117, 118, 119, 120 and 121. Calment had a leisurely life. Her father was a rich shipbuilder and her husband a prosperous businessman. She never worked. She outlived her husband by more than half a century and her only child, a daughter, by 63 years. Calment smoked all her life. At the age of 117, when she finally gave up, she was still smoking two cigarettes a day and ate a kilo of chocolate every week. <laughs> She's doing everything she can to kill herself. <laughs> but was active up to the very end and enjoyed robust health. Her proud and charming boast in old age was, I've never had but one wrinkle and I'm sitting on it. <laughs> Calment was also a beneficiary of one of the most delightfully misjudged deals ever made. In 1965, she ran into financial difficulties and she agreed to leave her apartment to a lawyer in return for a payment of 2,500 francs a month until she died. 
Since Calment was then 90, it seemed a pretty good deal for the lawyer. <laughs> In fact, it was the lawyer who died first, 30 years after signing the deal, having paid Calment more than 900,000 francs for an apartment he was never able to occupy. Wow. You'd think, you know, she's 90, I'll pay her a couple of thousand francs a month, she'll be gone soon, and then I'll get a free apartment. <laughs> she lived for another 32 years. That is a lovely story. Wow. 122. Fascinating. Right. I hope you found that interesting. Right, another job today is this perpetual spinach. Uh, first time ever this year it's bolted. Um, I think being in a raised bed doesn't help because as much as I water it, it does drain very quickly. Anyway, most of it I think has bolted and I cut off the flowering spikes a few weeks ago thinking that might help. Well it hasn't, they've just redeveloped. And I saw Monty Don on Gardener's World last week say, uh, when this happens, and it happened to his, chop it to the ground and it will regrow. So that's what I'm going to do. And we shall see. Well, take out the flowering spikes. And then, as he says, chop it to the ground. And I'm going to wait and see what happens. So I'm going to do that now, and then I'll show you the result. Well, if I'm honest, it's not the prettiest job. And there is one plant there that hasn't bolted, which I'm pleased about. But um, anyway, uh, they're cut back. And the perceived wisdom is if you hide your plants amongst others, then the pests won't find them. Well, I'd just like to refute that, <laughs> that myth. This is a, a cauliflower that didn't fit in one of the beds, so I thought, oh, I'll sneak it in next to the perpetual spinach and the cabbage whites won't find it. <laughs> well, they found it. Anyway, not to worry. Yes, job done. Let's see what happens now. Um, I thought I'd take the opportunity um, to show you very, very briefly um, our freezers back in the, kitchen, uh, in the garage. Um, because that's where most of this stuff ends up. You just can't eat this amount of produce, but we store it and freeze it. Um, and uh, we'll have a quick glimpse at that now. Well, there's a high demand in our garage for space with all my canoeing stuff, work stuff, and now all these freezers. The one on top there is a fridge. But just to show you how it all works, those three crates there have got my Kestrel second early potatoes in, um, ready to find somewhere to put them more permanently. I keep them covered to keep them in the dark. So if I can swing round in the limited space and let's discover together because this isn't what I do. This is this is Cheryl's domain. Ah, so this is all mixed fruit. Yeah, it's exclusively a fruit freezer. They're all black currants. And then each one of those bags is strawberries, blueberries, black currants, blackberries, uh, raspberries <laughs> in each bag. And we make smoothies out of those through the autumn and winter months. This is the new one we got for 20 quid. Oh, it's got some magnums in. Lovely. And then more fruit. Ah, and this has got uh, carrots, courgette. So this is a, a mixture of both fruit and veg. Um, and then there's more carrots. Uh, oh, and they're tomatoes, ready for making soups. Excuse the camera work. Um, right, so rhubarb, fruit, and then beans and carrots and uh, uh, squash, butternut squash from last year that we've still got to get through. And then the last one out here is again more more veg. All sorts of different vegetables. Um, I can see broccoli, broad beans, 
butternut squash, etc. Cauliflower. And then the same, <coughs> yeah, the same with the one in the house, the fridge freezer. So this is the sort of unit I knocked up recently just to sort of consolidate the space. And walking boots and then the bank of freezers and a spin dryer on the end which uh, exhausts out outside yeah so that's how we keep over winter our fruits and vegetables Well, after my initial worries that they would all bolt, actually, we've got a good crop with those behind the shed and these. They should see us through the winter. And they are some size. Very happy. And a nice little crop for tea. More tomatoes for the freezer. But that's it for the edamame beans. It was one tray of plug plants at the garden centre and that's all it's produced. <laughs> so it was an interesting little experiment but I can't see us repeating it. It doesn't seem worth the effort for the result you get. Anyway, yeah, very good. Well, it's warming up out there now. It's, it's quarter to ten and um, I'm going to head on home so I've got enough time to get a shower and change into something a little smarter uh, for when Charlotte and Carl arrive. But um, I got that bed done. That's the main thing. Um, that's all, oh no, it's not all the onions out. I've still got that bed of onions that I sowed from seed that not one bolted. But they're still in the ground and they're still very green. So I'll leave them till they start to turn brown. But. Uh, yeah, very good. And one of the advantages of this predictable dry hot weather is I can leave those onions on the soil to dry out knowing that they're not going to get damp. <laughs> so yeah, it was you know only a few hours but quite productive. The main thing is I got everything watered while it was still dark so that the water was going into cool soil. Um, so hopefully some of it's got down to the roots. Um, the people who turn up in the middle of the day here and you know and have a, have a rose on the end of the watering can and sort of do that I, I'm not convinced you know I mean I have to do that as well you know when I'm working and I get here in the mid-afternoon I've got no choice um, but I think a lot of that evaporates I don't think a lot of it reaches the roots um, so to get here when it was still dark and get a few hours of watering in I think is is worth the effort <laughs> As mad as it seems so we won't be here or I won't be here next weekend uh, we're away in the caravan after a quite a long break um, we're off to a place called Pandy near Abergavenny right in the uh, the lower hills of the Brecon Beacon so it should be good walking although I've got a feeling with the, the heat predicted this week and next weekend that we might be sitting under the shade of the caravan anyway whatever happens I shall be back in a fortnight so until then thanks for watching Thanks for those who are still subscribed. <laughs> and all being well, I shall see you in two weeks' time. Look after yourselves. Bye for now.